Hey guys, this is Nathan Hoover, and this presentation, this presentation is for uh, my professor Michael, as well as all of the other psychology students in this class, Mind and Brain. And in this video presentation, we're going to be covering sleep and what it is. So, let's get started with an introduction. So, this presentation is going to cover the concept of sleep as well as well as how it as well as how it connects to some of the psychological perspectives and major questions of psychology. Sleep is an important part of your daily routine and you spend about one third of your time doing that. Quality sleep is as essential to survival as food and water. Sleep is important for many functions in the brain, including the communication of neurons. Okay, so let's start with the psychological perspectives about sleep, starting with historical or past research. So let's start with the first major historical milestone. This one is going to be based on the the cognitive psychological perspective. So, in the 1920s, Dr. Nathaniel Kleetman opened up the first ever sleep lab at the University of Chicago. There, he studied the regulation of sleep and the human circadian rhythm. He and his students also examined the characteristics of chronic sleep disorders. One of his students, Dr. Eugene Asserinsky, teamed up with, the, with Nathaniel to discover REM sleep, which is rapid eye movement. So it's basically sleep that happens, and while that stage of sleep happens, your eyes move rapidly. Yeah, while your eyes are closed. They figured out that rapid eye movement was a typical phase of the sleep cycle, and it repeated four to five times in a normal night. And we have a picture right here of um, Dr. Nathaniel right here working on some stuff. Hold on, let me get the laser pointer. So we can see right here, here is Dr. Nathaniel Kleetman right here doing some tests on this guy who is sleeping. And he figured out that, that because his eyes are rapidly moving, he discovered this stage of sleep known as REM sleep. All right. The next major historical research is going to be based on the behaviorism psychological perspective. Okay? Sleep disorders are reasons why some people don't sleep as well or maybe sometimes they can behave in behave in strange ways. Research has been conducted on sleep disorders since the early 1960s when Mitchell Jalvet discovered that the pawns of the brain, which were responsible for handling unconscious processes, were also responsible for regulating REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. Also, according to a 1968 paper by Roger Broughton, parasomnias and bedwetting were identified as behaviors of confusional awakening from slow wave sleep instead of REM sleep. So basically, uh, this paper that Roger Broughton has has written, uh, basically in that paper, um, it explains uh, that there can be some behaviors that can happen with sleep, especially with sleep disorders, and bedwetting being one of them. I know that usually bedwetting happens with like young children, but if it happens to more older people, that can probably be a sign of a sleep disorder, as well as parasomnia. And also, as as I mentioned, Michael or Michelle Jalvet um, discovered how, um, you know, discovered, you know, discovered how REM sleep works with the pawns of the brain. So, uh, yeah. Here are some other historical uh, milestones based on sleep. In 1956, Professor 
Charles Sidney Burwell recognized the condition known as obstructive sleep apnea. In 1958, Dr. Aaron Lerner discovered the hormone that regulates sleep cycles known as melatonin. And if you guys didn't know already, melatonin is actually released from the pineal gland of the brain. And, you know, depending on lighting conditions, especially in the outdoors. In 1968, Alan Rechscathen and Anthony Kales published the first guideline based on all the sleep cycles. And I have a slide that talks all about the sleep cycles. And I will talk about that once we get to that slide. In 1970, Dr. William DeMent founded the first sleep lab at Stanford University, focusing specifically on sleep disorders. And I also have a, a slide that goes deeper, a little bit deeper into sleep disorders. And once we get to that slide, we'll talk a little bit more about um, those. In 1975, the Association excuse me, of of sleep disorder centers which eventually became the american academy of sleep medicine was founded and in 1982 dr carl smith researched rats and found that REM sleep is imperative to learning and recollection so yeah and we all know how sleep is we know we all know how important sleep is uh for memory and learning um, actually um, good sleep actually helps with your memory so yeah that's something that's really cool okay now we're going to talk about current research with with the same psychological perspectives about sleep so here we go so this is current research based on the cognitive perspective current research suggests that Brain cells orchestrate thoughts, feelings, and body movements and form dynamic networks that are essential for problem solving. However, in order to perform such energy demanding tasks, the brain cells require fuel and their consumption of nutrients from one's diet um, creates metabolic waste in the process. According to Jonathan Kipnis and Edith L. Wolf, it is critical that the brain disposes of metabolic waste that can build up and contribute to neurodegenerative diseases. So basically, um, what current research is saying is that the better sleep you have, the more metabolic wastes, you know, that are drained. So basically, um, yep. You're going to be creating fuel from sleep. It's essentially like it's essentially, it's essentially like you're recharging yourself while you're sleeping. So yeah, and yeah, as as these guys, as Jonathan Kipnis and Edith L. Wolf said, it says that the brain has to dispose of the metabolic waste that can build up over time, and can cause diseases. So if you don't want a higher risk of these diseases. Get your sleep, kids. <laughs> okay, now for the current research based on the behaviorism psychological perspective. Adults with obstructive sleep apnea, and yes, sleep disorders are considered are considered um, changed behaviors. They're more likely to experience long-term symptoms of COVID-19 as compared to those who didn't have the sleep disorder, according to a study supported by the National Institutes of Health. As a matter of fact, electronic health records have reported that adults with sleep apnea, meaning, um, you know, where the throat closes during sleep, may have a 75% higher risk of developing long-term sy symptoms of COVID-19, as thus their behavior could probably change as well because of the bad symptoms of COVID. According to Mariska K. Brown, um, we still have a lot to learn about the long-term effects of the virus, but this study could inform clinical care by identifying patients who may benefit from closer monitoring. I admit 
this slide probably isn't the best for explaining behavior, but um, but basically, any sleep disorder can cause a change in behavior. That can just happen due to negative stuff that is associated with sleep disorders that can cause negative moods over time. So this is probably this is probably why um, sleep will also fit with the behaviorism psychological perspective. Okay, now it's time to talk about the major questions about sleep. Um, so first we're gonna dis we're gonna define each major question, and then we're gonna discover how the tension of these questions, you know. You know, basically how these major questions connects with this topic of sleep. Starting with the mind and body major question, um, it emphasizes whether something can all be explained by bodily mechanisms, meaning throughout the body, or if more, or for more than the sum of our parts, the mind. This major question also determines the extent as to whether the mind is separate from the body or if the mind and body are connected in a certain topic. Okay, how the mind and body question connects with sleep. So in my opinion, the mind and body actually work together during sleep. They even work together before and after sleep. So that means during like waking hours and just before sleep. The pineal gland in the brain releases a sufficient amount of melatonin depending on how dark the outside environment is. This is the reason why that after daily after daylight savings times is ended, um, it actually gets darker earlier, which causes you to get more tired earlier. And as we go to sleep, the brain starts producing alpha waves. This is just before sleep. And then during stage N1 sleep, we produce theta waves. And then we produce a speed spindle and a K complex during stage in two sleep, and then delta, wa delta waves during stage in three sleep, otherwise known as slow wave sleep, and finally beta waves during REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep. Many structures in the brain are actually more active during sleep than we are awake, um, and that includes the motor cortex. The amygdala, which helps with emotions. Oh, yes, yeah, so the motor cortex is with movement. The amygdala is for emotions, but this also includes the visual association area, you know, for visual stuff, and the brainstem, which includes like the pons, the medulla, and as for the bot. And while the brain does most of the work, I'll admit, uh, the body is also part. Um, of the sleeping cycle. So as for the body, during stage N1 sleep, we actually tend to have an involuntary hypnic jerk that happens. And sometimes we feel scared, like, whoa, why the frick did we experience a hypnic jerk like that? Like, whoa, that's a little crazy. Anyway, this usually occurs as we go from an awake state to a sleepy state. Also, while parts of the brain are actually more active and tend to create more vivid dreams, most of our physical body is paralyzed. Yeah, so most of the muscles on our physical body are paralyzed, besides from some rapid eye movements during REM sleep. So, yeah. That's pretty much all there is to say for that slide. That's a lot of information. Okay, now for the Universal and ideographic major question. I believe this major question also connects to the topic of sleep. The universal and ideographic major question, excuse me, tries to understand how behavior and other data should be represented. Excuse me. Should the data be based on groups and averages or individuals and personal case studies? So, Basically, this major question is trying to determine if data should be represented, you know, and studied within a whole group, or if it should be studied individually, one person at a time.
Okay, how the universal and ideographic question connects with sleep. For the most part, I believe that we tend to study and think about sleep universally. In other words, most people go through the exact same processes and stages in order to sleep, except maybe for those with sleep disorders. My opinion on this is that most people um, go through the exact same sleep stages and they and most of these people produce these exact same waves as you can probably see on this graph which you will see better on the next slide <clears throat> and uh yeah so because most people actually go through the exact same stages with the exact same waves I believe that sleep um, um, is able to be studied and thought about, um, um, you know, universally. EEGs are great at producing waves. Uh, sorry for the pause. Anyway, EEGs are great at producing waves from the brain in order to determine what stage of sleep an individual is at. At normal waking levels, the brain produces beta waves. As for the rest of the stages, the brain will produce alpha waves, then theta waves, and then a sleep spindle and K-complex, and then delta waves, and then finally beta waves again during REM sleep. Most brains will produce similar if not exact waves that will correlate with their designated sleep cycle. Although the brains of people with sleep disorders may produce different sleep cycles, sleep waves for the most part most brains will produce the sleep waves that are supposed to be produced this is why i believe that you know yeah okay now we're gonna look specific specifically more into the stages of sleep so here is our awake stage and in this stage we produce beta waves so beta waves oh my goodness okay wow okay this is not the best chart i chose sorry actually wait no yeah it is okay never mind i don't know what i just said sorry here is the calm wakefulness stage, otherwise known as just before sleep. And at this stage, we produce alpha waves. Okay. And then during stage N1 sleep, we produce theta waves. This is already written out for us, so, yep. And then in stage two, we produce sleep spindles and K complexes. Okay. And then during stage three and four, yep, there's actually a fourth stage of sleep, but uh, we usually interpret this as stage in three sleep. Um, here we produce delta waves. And then we're on to REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. And in this stage, we produce beta waves again. There we go. There is our sleep stage cycle. There is our sleep stages. Okay, let's think about the facts about sleep now. The longest someone has gone without sleep is 11 days and 25 minutes, which is really long and is not at all healthy. That can cause sleep deprivation, and it could also cause you to die, actually. Because if you don't sleep for a particular number of days, you could die. Daylight savings times can be fatally bad and can cause a rise and heart attacks and I believe and this is because 
an extra hour is actually added during during say like during daylight savings and people tend not to sleep as long during these times and that can actually kind of be a bad thing as it can cause a rise in fatal heart attacks but when say but when daylight saving times ends that hour is gone less hours and and lower risks of heart attacks if you think you don't dream think again you may have just forgotten your dreams now although a sleep hypothesis suggests that there's really no such thing as dreams i still believe there is such things as dreams and a lot of times i don't think i've really dreamt but it could just be because i've forgotten the dreams a really good way guys um to to remember your dreams is to have a dream journal with you as soon as you wake up write down what you've dreamt about and you got to do it as soon as you wake up otherwise you're going to forget that dream pretty much immediately sleep struggles are not only a human problem as a matter of fact a lot of insects like like ants and stuff um can have sleep insomnia and stuff like that many adults nap and you should too a really cool thing about naps is that they can actually help with your mental health i believe and um it can give you a quick recharge in case you're like really tired during the afternoon or something or just need to take a nap after a long class session or something like that so that way you can kind of re-energize yourself um you know for like short re-energizations maybe do like a 30 minute nap it's it's all it's actually a really good idea that you take naps even though i don't really do that maybe i'll start doing that soon not sure yet okay sleep disorders we have insomnia which is the repeated inability to be able to go to sleep next we have sleep apnea in which a person while sleeping actually stops breathing because of the closing of the throat in many cases they're probably going to require some sort of machine in order to be able to sleep well next we have narcolepsy in which a person experiences excessive sleepiness during the waking hours rem behavior disorder is when a person acts out their dreams while sleeping for example um say that a person is dreaming about a zombie attack and attacking zombies using like a sword or something <laughs> that is a very unreal situation but with that disorder a person will actually act out the fact that they're in a real like zombie attack or zombie apocalypse and they're fighting using like a sword um but say they don't have a sword they're gonna pick up something that's that looks or feels like a sword and then we got sleepwalking which is actually a lot more common in young children and usually happens during slow wave sleep or stage in three sleep basically a person becomes unaware of their surroundings and other people so uh yeah here's some ways to establish better sleeping habits you're gonna think of a routine for your sleep schedule and go to bed at the same time every night and wake up at the same time every morning that way that way you kind of have a consistent sleeping schedule and that'll actually help you out avoid alcohol and caffeine while alcohol um <laughs> due to hangovers it actually help you sleep it actually disrupts the sleeping cycle and caffeine because it's a stimulant it actually prevents you from going to sleep you know caffeine or coffee is usually supposed to help wake you up in the morning not use before sleep so avoid alcohol and caffeine at all costs during the evenings avoid electronic devices at night now this is something i don't do i i'm always on my phone watching youtube videos while i'm while i'm trying to sleep but basically um due to the white light of those electronic devices that can that can actually make it more difficult for you to go to sleep you should also exercise regularly as it will maintain the sleep cycle relax then just relax 
Don't worry about the future. Don't worry about the past. Just think about the present moment as you sleep. Like, you especially do not want to think about the future. Even though you may think it's bad, just don't worry about it. And then, if you have, um, if you find yourself, um, finding it a hard time to go to sleep, don't force yourself to go to sleep. Instead, just get up and do something that is relaxing, like reading a book, reading a good book until you get really tired and then try going back to the bed. Okay, in conclusion, the take-home message of the research found on sleep is that while many people, like us, but also including scientists and those with PhDs and doctors and stuff, know, must, know most of what we need to know for how sleeping works. Although some research for the future is probably still being investigated. Like, we not, we're probably not 100% sure, but we're like maybe 80 to 90% sure. Thanks to many people over the last century, we now understand exactly what it takes for sleep to occur. We understand the sleep disorders, we understand the sleep stages, we understand exactly what the brain does and, you know, and how it works during sleep, how our bodies work during sleep, all that stuff. Um, the brain produces sleep waves during the stages of sleep as we go from an awake state to a sleepy state. We also understand that REM sleep happens due to the rapid movement of the eyes while they're closed. We also, we also understand quite a lot about the different sleep disorders, some common and some rare. Sleep is an extremely important part of our lives and is just as essential as food, water, and store, and shelter. Without sleep, we probably wouldn't be able to survive. Alright guys, thank you guys for watching this video presentation. Um, this video presentation will be uploaded before the actual uh, PowerPoint presentation, so this video presentation will be uploaded tonight and the the presentation power the powerpoint presentation itself um will be uploaded tomorrow and i know it says to include some references i don't have them here in this video but i will include them in the actual powerpoint presentation so don't worry if this presentation feels incomplete it is not in it is not exactly incomplete. I will be adding the references to here. I've done I've looked at some websites and done some research for this presentation and I hope you guys enjoyed this. So, this is Nathan Hoover signing off. Stay Gucci guys.